Hi friends, it's Mrs. Harden and I'm going to read chapter 17 of Rump and it's called Martha's Endless Tales. The king is going to marry tomorrow? A commoner? It's what they're saying, a very rich commoner. Supposedly, she can turn straw into gold. They say she's a witch. A man and a woman were speaking in hushed but dramatic voices. I tried to open my eyes, but my lids were heavy. But the king wouldn't marry a witch. He would if she could turn straw into gold. Nothing the king loves more than gold, and I'd think he'd do anything to get it. I felt like I was waking from a very bad dream where I had just been promised a baby into another bad dream where my whole body felt like I had fallen out of a tower. Then I remembered that both were true. I groaned. Oh, he's waking, poor thing. I opened my eyes to see the woman leaning over me. She was very plump, and even though she seemed worried, I thought she must be a kind person. Her cheeks were round and red as apples, and all the lines in her face looked like they naturally moved upward into broad smiles and hearty laughs. Here now, little lamb, she said, drink up. There's a lad. She placed a cup to my mouth and I drank a hot broth. It helped me wake up a little bit and I looked around to see where I was. The room was large and bustling. I hadn't noticed all the other noise, but servants were coming and going, bringing dishes and trays and buckets and rags. Two large fireplaces were burning bright with large pots over the flames. The walls were gray crumbling stone. I was in the kitchens of the castle. This was not where I wanted to be. You took quite a fall there, boy. A man came and stood beside me. He wore a red and gold uniform with a big sword at his side. I shrank back. Don't worry, he chuckled. I'm not going to hurt you. Though you were causing mischief now, weren't you? The guard didn't seem accusing, rather amused. He was much younger than the kind woman, but he had the same laughing face covered with a beard Oh, Helmet, he's just a curious boy, said the woman, chuckling. Remember how you were now always sneaking around corners, trying to get a peepsy at anything mysterious or exciting? I remember the time you pinched a swig of the ki king's finest wine, and you were just a lad, and it all came back up on my clean kitchen floor. Yes, you whacked me good for that one, said the soldier which is why I straightened out and became a keeper of the peace from the little hooligans like, he was only curious, no crime in that now, is there? Probably heard the gossip and came running to see. I'm curious too. Might have climbed the tower myself if I didn't think I'd bring down the whole castle. She chuckled and her whole plump body laughed with her, like Oswald the Miller. Only I liked her and her laugh much better. It was, it was, it made me want to laugh too. Only instead of laughing, my body seized up in pain and I coughed my lungs out. Oh, now there, there, little lamb, drink some more. You've banged yourself up quite a bit. There's no padding on those scrawny bones of yours. Can be quite useful, you know, she patted her wide hips. Now then, what's your name? Everyone prefers to be called by their name, don't they? Not everyone. Robert, I said. The lie just slipped from my mouth and I realized it was what Opal had called me. But I was glad I didn't tell her my real name. Everyone on the mountain already knew, so I never had to explain it to anyone. And I didn't want to explain it now. I didn't have the energy. Well, Robert, said the woman, I'm Martha, one of the king's cooks, and this is my son, Helmet. I named him so he could be the stalwart soldier, brave and fearless, which I am said Helmet. But really, he wouldn't hurt a fly. I might as well have named him Fluffy. That's enough, you old bat, said Helmet, but he was smiling. That's mother to you, Fluffy. Now give me those stockings. Helmet held out a pair of stockings worn through with holes, and Martha began to darn them. It reminded me painfully of Gran. Gran used to darn my stockings. Now they had a lot of holes in them. I could feel my toes sticking out, rubbing against the worn leather of my shoes. Well, said Helmet, I'd best get back to my post. 
Looks like we'll need to be extra vigilant to keep young hooligans from trying to get a peek at the future queen. The king has ordered a double guard around her chamber. He winked at me, then kissed his mother on the cheek and left. Martha looked after him as though she were very proud, even if she did tease him about his gentleness. I wondered if my mother ever would have looked at me like that had she lived. Now, Robert, he said. I looked around a bit, wondering who she was talking to until I remembered that I was Robert. What brings you here? You don't belong in the castle now, do you? I froze, my mind racing to come up with some explanation, but Martha didn't wait for an answer. Oh, don't tell me. I can tell it's a secret, and so you better keep it, because I won't. Strange business, this girl in the gold. No good can come of it if you ask me. I never saw anything good come of magic in the end, you know. Always a price to pay. I knew a woman who worked in the kitchens who went to a witch to get a potion to make her beautiful. And the potion did make her beautiful, but it gave her horrible breath. So what good could it do? And she got old besides. There is no potion I know of, know of for curing old age. Ah, me. Martha talked without breathing ten words for every stitch in the stocking, and she stitched fast. But I didn't mind because it saved me from having to explain myself. Now, this business with the gold. If that King Bartholomew Archibald Reginald Fife is as wise as his name, which I seriously doubt, he'll keep away from this mischief and focus on crops. Gold won't feed a kingdom. It wouldn't. On the mountain, gold had always meant food. The miller Oswald said it himself. Gold means food, and the more, more you found, the more you ate. But then I suppose the food had to come from somewhere. Is there not much food in the kingdom? I asked Martha. Oh, goodness, didn't you know? But no, you're so young, you can't be more than ten. This surprised me. Even though I was twelve, I'd never passed for eight. I was delighted to be pronounced ten. Well, continued Martha, the crops in the valley have suffered from bad weather and such. It's not a famine this year, but if we have another poor harvest, well, then we can all add a little more water to our stew. So there really had been a shortage of food. Perhaps I had judged the miller Oswald too harshly. But the scarcity is everywhere, Martha continued. We haven't had much gold come from the mountain, and that is our main source of trade, you know. And gold is all the king cares about. Dear me, have you been in the castle? Gold everywhere. Not in the kitchens, of course, but everywhere else. Gold mirrors, gold vases, even the floors are gilded with gold, and the king drapes himself in gold every day. Martha continued stitching as she spoke. He could probably trade the gold with another kingdom for some extra food. But oh no, it is the delight of his life. The servants spend half their time warding off pixies. Oh dear me, what a nuisance. I know a wench who's swollen half the time from all the bites. But if that troubles the king, you'd never know it. And here we are on the brink of starvation. She sighed the first breath I'd heard from her in ten minutes. Well, you can't neglect your crops and expect to feast. Maybe this girl will set us right in the end. Perhaps she can make gold into milk and potatoes. Martha went on, speaking of different calamities magic had bought, and the gossip about the girl who could turn straw into gold. She knew all the details of the wedding that was to take place the next day, down to what flowers would go on the cake and in the bride's hair, and how the king was planning to throw out gold coins to the crowds. Martha continued to talk as she bustled around the kitchen, chopping meat and vegetables. She fed me a delicious meat pie, and when I tried to get up, she pushed me back down and told me I wouldn't be moving that night. But you tell me where to find your mother, and I'll fetch a gnome and send her a message so she doesn't worry. You need to rest after such a fall. Well, I... Oh, I see, she chuckled. She doesn't know where you've gone. You're a mischievous little one. Well, I can't say my helmet didn't do the same. Always seemed to be up to his nose in trouble. But still, she'll worry her heart out for you. So we must send a message. I'll say that you've had a bit of an accident. No need to give the details, but I'll tell her you're safe and Martha will care for you until you're well enough to go home. Now, what's your mother's name, dear? My tongue wagged. Red, I blurted out. If a message had to go to someone, it might as well go to her. That way, I wouldn't have to explain Martha anything. 
Strange name. She must be a curious person. I silently agreed. But then, I don't put too much stock in names these days. I knew a girl named Gladolia, who was supposed to be beautiful, but she grew crooked and cross-eyed, and then there's my helmet. Ah, me, she laughed and moved to the window. Message? She said in a high-pitched sing-song voice, and she pulled up a fat little gnome who wriggled with excitement. Now what would you like to tell her, Robert? Uh, tell her I'm sorry to make her worry. I'll be home soon. Martha spouted off a long message to the gnome, including all the details of my injuries, precisely where I was and who Martha was and who her son Helmet was. But when she asked the gnome to repeat the message, he got it all mixed up, and so she did it again and made it longer. But he still got it all mixed up. So they went back and forth, and finally Martha lost patience and threw him out the window. The gnome scurried away, chanting, Red for message! Red for message! I wondered how long it would take him to find Red, and if she'd make any sense of the message. She'd probably understand enough, and I knew what she'd think. She'd think that she had told me so. I had spun myself in a heap of trouble. Opal had promised me her firstborn child. My stomach was sick with the thought. Opal didn't understand the magic. She didn't think I would ever really take her baby. Or perhaps she thought she could back out of her side of the bargain. But what she didn't understand was that I had to take the baby. Red had explained to me that the rules are rules and the magic binds you to those rules. Opal had promised her baby and she had taken my gold. I must take her baby if she ever had one. But that was only the beginning of my troubles. There was still the spinning and the gold. Surely the king would want Opal to spin more. Would he threaten to kill his own queen if she didn't spin more straw into gold? Would I have to stay here forever, always at the queen's beck and call when she needed straw spun to gold? No, I couldn't. I thought of all the things Opal could foolishly promise me. Her right eye, an arm and a leg, more children. I saw my destiny clearly now. I was holding a dozen crying babies and trying to spin a mountain of straw into gold while Opal screamed at me to hurry up because she's the queen. I felt dizzy. My head hurt. I couldn't go home. I had to get away, far away. I had to go someplace where I wouldn't hear about Opal or the king or the baby. But mostly, I had to find a stiltskin. A stiltskin was the only way I could fix all this mess. That's what my mother had been looking for. That's what the witch of the woods said I needed. But where could I find one? The witch said I must look. But look where? Under rocks? Under the ground? In a tree? In the sky? In yonder or beyond? In the morning, the castle rang with chimes and bells, not like the single gong of the village bell in the mountains, but dozens of them ringing in all different tones. It should have been a lovely sound, but it made my head throb and ache. Well, Robert, said Martha, I'm off to the wedding. Methinks I shall fetch a bit of gold today. Wouldn't that be something? Be good and rest, and I shall bring you back a coin made by your very own queen. Maybe some good will come of it. There's bread and more pies, dear. Tuck in and eat, eat, eat. I hate to see such skinny bones on a growing boy. When Martha was gone, I sat up and threw off the blankets. I slid out of bed, wincing at the pain in my sides. I felt dizzy on my feet and steadied myself for a moment. Martha had placed all my things neatly by the fire. My shoes and my little satchel with the bobbin and water skin. I ate another meat pie and a slice of bread, and because Martha had told me to eat, I put the loaf of bread in my satchel and another pie. I felt guilty, but I needed some food to travel. I wish I could do something for Martha for being so kind to me. Spin her a spool of gold or a pile of it, but for all her kindness, she hadn't made me any bargains. Besides, she didn't have a spinning wheel. And, quite frankly, I was done with spinning. It was time to leave it all behind forever. Thank you for listening to me read.